God's people said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, please, 1 John 3, verses 11 to 18. We'll be jumping in in just a second here, uh, but I want to remind you, as we did last week at the beginning, of the context of 1 John. It's very important to understand what 1 John's about before you just start going reading willy-nilly, which is fine. Read willy-nilly. Read, read, read. But understanding why John wrote matters a lot. So as we jump in the text, it's important to remember that he was writing to reassure the believers. He probably had some sort of shepherding, pastoral kind of relationship with a number of churches, a fellowship of churches, or somehow he knew them because he was an apostle. So he was writing to them to reassure them that their faith in Jesus was genuine. And that mattered because they had recently been severely disrupted by false teachers who claimed that these people in these churches weren't believing the right things. They were saying, you don't really believe all this mumbo jumbo about Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time, right? Like, you can't really believe that he's God, divine God in the flesh, right? Like, you can't really think that he was flesh like you and me. He was just a spiritual being. He only seemed like he was in the flesh and had a physical body. And and they were probably saying, like, you aren't saved, in fact, by believing in a physical Jesus who was in history, in time, in the flesh, crucified and raised. You, You can't believe in that. In fact, you aren't saved by believing in that. You're saved by you know, doing life our way because we live a super, you know, super cool spiritual way of living that, that you don't know because you're losers and we're cool. And we know lots of secret cool things you don't. You think I'm making that up. That's the kind of thing that was going around in religious circles at the time. So they were saying things like, if you lived like us, you would be able to ascend beyond. You'd, you'd be able to overcome the physical corruption of the world and ascend into a higher divine universal consciousness. They were kind of forerunners to modern New Age hippies that were into universal consciousness and the truth that combines us all through weed and bell bottoms. It's kind of a first century equivalent of that. You can look it up, proto-Gnosticism. So, not only had these false teachers thrown these people off because they were saying they didn't believe the right things, but they took people with them from these churches. And they had been their friends. So they were struggling with losing people they had relationships with, with which they were unified and going the same direction with which they thought they had relationships of love, of mutual love. But they're gone, and the false teachers had taken them. And so they had all these lingering questions about their salvation and whether they were the real deal. And so John writes to reassure them, y'all are the real deal. And here's why. Here's how. As he says in 1 John 3, 11 to 18, you'll know because Christ-like love, Christ-like sacrificial love for one another is the evidence that you're born of God. We see this right at the beginning. Jump into verse 11, where we see the command to love in 11 to 12. John starts by reminding them of this old command that Jesus said it was a new command, but that was really an old command. Let me show you what we mean here. In 1 John 3, verse 10, John had just said negatively that not following, that not loving one's fellow believer was evidence of not being genuine. And so here he says it positively, verse 11. For this is the message, meaning the news, as in good news. This is the message that you've heard from the beginning. Not just the beginning of 1 John, but the beginning of their relationship with God through Christ. Because Christ said to them, you should love one another. He says, this is the message that you've been hearing from the very beginning from Jesus himself, that we should love one another. John just got done in verse 10 saying, if you don't love, you're not genuine. And so he says it positively here. And he'll go back and forth between, you know, not loving and loving throughout this whole passage. So he says, 
This is the message you've heard from the beginning. And it's not a new message, though Jesus calls it a new message. It's actually an old message that Jesus says there's a new twist on. We'll show you what we mean. It's old because God had commanded this way back in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 19, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as you take care of and love yourself. Okay, sounds good. But here's the new part. John 13, 34, and 5. This is Jesus speaking to the first followers. And at first it sounds like something different. Verse 34. A new commandment, he says, that I give to you. A new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. That's not new, Jesus. Right, that's old. Love one another was old. Love your neighbor as yourself. But here's the new part. Just as I have loved you. Meaning in the, the manner of. In the manner of my sacrificial death that brings life and light and that extends the Father's grace and through the Spirit makes hearts new. In the manner of my death for you, you shall love one another. So as I have loved you, John 13, 34, you also are to love one another. And actually, I think John 13, 35 is a forerunner to the idea in 1 John in other words, John gets the idea from Jesus in the first place that love for one another is evidence of genuine faith. Verse 35 says, By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So love for one another in the body of Christ, among believers, brothers and sisters. Love for one another looks like Jesus sacrificial love in his death is evidence of genuine faith and it's also witness to the world. So back to 1 John 3, 11. When John says that this is the command they've heard from the beginning, he's stressing that love's not optional. He's saying it's something that all Christians understand as a, as a kind of piece of their identity because they're born of that love from God. And then he contrasts the command to love one another. Remember, verse 10, negatively stated. Verse 11, positively stated. Here we are in verse 12, negatively stated. We should not be like Cain. Cain and Abel, beginning of Genesis, in chapter 4, Cain kills Abel because Abel gives his gift, his sacrifice in worship to God in the way that God asked him to. He did it obediently and by faith, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. Cain was jealous of Abel. He hated Abel. He hated that Abel obeyed God. He hated that God accepted Abel's faith. That's key. Cain hated that God accepted Abel's faith. So, verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, born of the evil one, and murdered his brother. Literally, he was a people killer. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Which is not a statement of his own deeds were evil and that's why <laughs> he was condemned, though that would be true of any and all, but because his offering was not given in faith and his brother's was counted as righteous because of his faith. So Cain's hatred and his jealousy led to violence. And that's the counterexample to the practical love that happens among believers Cain's hatred and his jealousy led to violence, revealing his, his real identity, his true nature. John carries on this hatred theme in verses 13 and following because he uses Cain's hatred as, as an example of the world's hatred. He says this, verse 13, don't be surprised. That word is also sometimes translated in the New Testament as amazed amazed. 
Like, don't be, don't be taken by surprise that the world hates you. Don't be taken by surprise, brothers, that the world hates you. For the record, brothers, sisters, it's all, brothers is a stand-in for all in the family of God. John says the world hates you because it's opposed to God's truth. It's opposed to God as creator. It's opposed to God saying this is the standard of holiness. And, and just as Cain hated Abel because Abel was obedient and faithful, the world hates those who follow Christ. Don't be surprised by that, he says. That's normal. In fact, it's kind of an expected response. And he roots, strangely, evidence of being genuinely a Christian, not just in love for one another, but in being hated by the world. Because that's the normal expected response. I'm not making this up. Jesus said it. In John 15, 18 through 19, Jesus says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Which is a way of saying, yes, that hatred is normal. But it's also a way of saying, know that that hatred is not really about you as much as, you know, it may feel or as, as much as you may think. It's about hating me, Jesus is saying. And that's its own evidence of being genuinely in Christ and born of him. And even this is an assurance, a strange assurance to believers. Remember, negative, positive, negative, positive. Positive love for one another is evidence of being genuinely a believer and the world hating because you have your faith in Christ. That's its own negative example of the same. Keep reading, verse 14. Even that's an assurance, remember. We know that we've passed out of death into life. How? Because we love the brothers. Love is the evidence. Whoever does not love, again, because we love the brothers, positive. Whoever does not love, negative, abides in death, which is a funny way of saying it. Whoever doesn't love, abides, lives, remains in death. In verse four, uh, sorry, 15, John further intensifies this point <laughs> when he equates hatred with murder. Notice here, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him, remaining in him. Now, in Matthew 5, Jesus himself equates hatred with murder, anger, with murder in the same way that John does here. And given that this context has false teachers who were teaching heretical doctrine, and John says that they were not actually of us, says they were children of the evil one, they were born of the devil, he calls them antichrists because they hated those who had faith and trust in Christ. Which is to say, it is hatred of one's brother or sister to encourage or affirm rebellion against God's holy standards, against what is clear in his word. It is not helpful human flourishing tolerance to affirm anybody's sin. Whether by positively saying and affirming or by failing to wittingly letting someone you should love go down a route that ends in their death. This love for one another thing is a big deal. 
and to encourage or affirm rebellion against God's holy standards is to be like Cain. Is to not love. Is to act like God's holy standards don't matter. So everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. As a counterexample of loving, especially given the context where there were those who said, your faith and belief in Jesus, that's wrong. So how do we know love? 16 through 18, through Christ's example. There are a number of places in our series where it defines love in this way. We talked about it a little bit last week in saying that love comes from God and is defined by his eternal character in nature, his holiness. Love originates with and from him, and it's demonstrated through Christ. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. (laughs) He laid down his life for us by sacrificing of himself and dying on the cross so that we might live. His death is so that we might live. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. In other words, Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is the highest expression of love. It's the pinnacle. It's the defining characteristic of love. He said in John 15, Jesus himself said, greater love has no man than this, no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Meaning, Jesus didn't just theoretically proclaim love. (laughs) He demonstrated it by laying down his life in the most profound way possible, in practical terms, as a voluntary act, when no human deserved it, and he was not obligated to do it. Which is to say, is there a more profound definition of love? Perfect, sinless God, creator of all, in the flesh to a creation that's in rebellion against him that wants to live apart from him in our own sin. (laughs) He gives of himself in Jesus voluntarily when we were in rebellion, when we didn't want it. But we wanted to go our own way a voluntary act of love that ended up providing the means for our salvation when we had no means. That is is the greatest example of love. Which is a very highfalutin, hard to attain, kind of like lay down your life. Which it might mean that. Plenty of Christians have become martyrs for the sake of the gospel being communicated. Plenty of Christians have sacrificed of self in ways that meant physical death. Sure, yes. But (laughs) what's being said here isn't just that. It might mean that extent. But it also means everything up to and leading to that. All the way down to individual, practical, relatively small acts of love that any and all of us can do. I'm not making this up. Verse 17 takes the high calling down to practical terms. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how can God's love abide in him? This phrase about closing one's heart, um, it can also be translated as, it's going to sound weird, but this is how they described emotions and compassion. Closing one's heart could be shutting up one's bowels of compassion. The bowels were the 
seed of emotions in their conception. And so when we see a brother or a sister in need, and we have the means, and we do nothing, John says we are essentially closing off the flow of God's love through us. And we're closing off our experience of God's love. You see, friends, it's not just about giving. It's about experiencing, understanding tangibly for oneself when one gives and when one receives. It's all the same experience of God's love in action. Which is why he says in verse 18, little children, it's a term of endearment. It's saying those who are in God's family, be assured If you love actually, then you're his. Let us not love in word or talk, meaning in empty words that aren't also lived, but let us love in deed and in truth. Let us love so that our actions align with the truth of God's word and show that we are his. James 2 says it like this. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, (laughs) be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So so genuine faith produces genuine love expressed in practical care for others. And that reflects the character of God and demonstrates that you have been transformed by the news that salvation is possible through God's love. So, three thoughts about how we live this out. And the first is relatively easy. We won't spend much time on it. What does it mean to love one another? First, usually, love one another means saying or doing something that that builds up, that encourages, and is generally fun for all involved, both the giver and the receiver. for the sayer or for the doer, the one initiating or carrying it out. It's a moment of experiencing Christ's love in action and responding in gratitude. For the hearer or the recipient, it's the same. It's a moment of experiencing God's love in action. It's a moment of God's love being made real and receiving God's provision. So for both the giver and the receiver, it's... It's fun. So my question is, why why would we not do this more? If if it's an experience of God's presence and love made real in ways that parallel God in Christ sacrificing himself on the cross for us, if it's an experience of more deeply experiencing and seeing in practical terms God's love for us, Why would we not do this more? I really really want to have a a deep, a deep relationship with God. Okay, awesome. Then, say or do something that builds up, that encourages. It's not hard. It's not difficult. In fact, it's right there in the text. You don't have to be heroic. You don't have to die on the cross for somebody. It can be a whole bunch of things leading up to that that are tiny, that are relatively small, that don't require you to have financial resources or material wealth in any form or fashion. In fact, the text makes this clear in verses 16 and 17. It says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Now, when it talks about Jesus laying down his life for us, it meant the full extent of his death on the cross, of course. It's a phrase, laying down one's life, that he uses and says that. Most of the time, that phrase was referring to shepherds taking care of their sheep. And occasionally, a shepherd would have to be in some sort of physical threat or danger to care for the sheep and keep them alive and... But most of the time, laying down 
the shepherd's life was a way of keeping the sheep alive, feeding them, caring for their needs, taking them where they needed to go, the kind of thing that, like, anybody can do. And then also, notice in verse 16, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. <laughs> Which feels like, wait, I, I ought to lay down my life for everybody? Like that's plural. Brothers, all the brothers, all the sisters, everybody. <laughs> that's, I mean, it sounds relatively impossible. But again, don't forget, transition from 16 to 17. But if anyone has the world's goods, and then also in verse 17, it goes from plural in 16 to singular in 17. If anyone has the world's good and sees his brother, the practical application part of the entire passage says, you, you just have to see a brother or sister in need. And if you have the means to help in whatever way, you've laid down your life. You've, you've given of self for the sake of someone else. It's not hard. It's really quite easy. It could be physical needs. It could be emotional support. It could be a spiritual encouragement. It could be a whole host of things. So send the card. Send the text. Give the anonymous check to your pastor. I'm just kidding. I made a joke about cars first service. I was like, it isn't really the cars, it's the car insurance. We have four drivers and four cars. Goodness sakes. If, if you see someone who, who is in need, meet the need. It's, it's a way that encourages and builds up. It brings hope. It's not, it's not rocket science. You don't have to die. You have to give up self. You have to lay yourself down. Number two, and by the way, I don't want your checks. Number two, unless it's from our financial secretary that comes through your general fund giving that supports 16 staffers. Okay. Number two, occasionally, this one's harder, love one another means saying or doing something that does build up, but that refines. And it's hard for all involved. The question for the first one is, why wouldn't you do this more? <laughs> this one is, why, why don't you? What keeps you from communicating care that's correction? We have a team code maxim. Team code maxims are seven things that make our teams go, and they all start with we. And the second one says, <laughs> And those of you who are new, this is a weird word. We pray pair, which is a word we made up. P-R-A-Y-P-A-R-E. -E. It means to pray and prepare as if the work we're doing matters. We pray pair as if souls are at stake, which they are. As if the word does the work, which it does. As if excellent, excellence matters, which it does. And as if feedback helps. Feedback helps because it refines. And we're not just talking about willy-nilly feedback. Like, correction is care, but like, we don't have to define correction as anything and everything, especially anything and everything we don't want to hear. This is about correction that aligns us with God's will. How do we know God's will? God's word. And this is the kind of correction that is care if it's delivered carefully, thoughtfully, for the sake of the good of the person's growth, not for self, not to get at anything about them or at them for. It's something that needs to be done filtered through God's word prayerfully and that assumes the best intentions of them and that it's done prayerfully. Which is why the text says we should not be like Cain. To refuse the kind of love that's correction 
that aligns someone to God's will, to refuse to do that is the functional hatred of being like Cain. And we don't do that for a whole host of reasons. Like, <laughs> we're, we're, we're scared. Fear. Afraid to say something that perhaps might be hard to hear for somebody else. Fear of being rejected or misunderstood. Sure, that may be the case. <laughs> but if it's clear that someone is in rebellion against God's will, in sin and rebellion against him in ways that need repentance, to fail to communicate what you know through God's word someone needs to hear is to not care. So love one another can't possibly be just the easy, fun stuff that's practical. It has to mean the eternal destiny of those around us. And when it's done fittingly, when it's done wisely, when it's done carefully and prayerfully and through God's word, for the sake of the growth of the person, done in actual love and compassion and concern, not out of self, not because of self-righteousness, not because you think somebody needs to hear something, but because they really do need to hear it. And it's done fittingly and wisely. Just like the first one, for both the giver and recipient, it's a moment of experiencing Christ's love and action. Finally, thirdly, we've talked about usually, <laughs> occasionally. Now we're going to talk about always. Always, love one another means sacrificing for others like Christ, because we realize that sacrificing for others is experiencing God's grace, and it's a way that our lives witness to his love. And so loving one another means sacrificing for others because, not because the pastor stands up and says, thus saith the Lord, there are reasons why thus saith the Lord is what you should do, sure. But because you actually want to have deep and abiding relationship with God and experience his grace and mercy and understand the depth of his love. So you sacrifice for others. Why? Because experiencing God's grace and witnessing to his love <laughs> is worth everything. And what reasons do you need other than those to love one another? Loving one another is the expression of God's grace and mercy and love practiced tangibly. Friends, this is how we grow. This is how we become who God called and created and designed us to be. This is how we learn to bear fruit for God's glory. This is how we become strengthened as a body to be a witness to those. They will know that we are of God because of our love for one another. So are you growing in your understanding and your practice of Christ-like love? Are you growing in your understanding and your practice of Christ-like love that sacrifices for others because you want to experience God's grace. Deeply understand more than you do now the depth of his grace so that your life would be a witness, so that you would experience the joy of witnessing to that love. Let's just simply ask this takeaway question and uh, end in prayer. In what way is God calling you? In what tangible, practical way is God calling you to love your brother or sister? this week. Let's pray, friends. Father in heaven, we're gathered because you've loved us first. You showed us what love is, defined it for us, showed us what it looks like, enabled it in us 
through your spirit. So we ask that you would continue to engender within us a passion for your goodness and glory being made known. A deep desire to know you intimately. The courage to do and to say what is needful and helpful for the sake of life growing in them for the sake of others becoming who you've called and created and gifted them to be. For the sake of those who are lost, knowing you forever through your son Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would continue to give us the faith and courage to love one another well. For the sake of your goodness and glory, we pray. Amen.